Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to this roundtable on assessment of whole child development challenges and solutions. This is the first of a series of roundtables that the Whole Child Development for Displaced Learners Network is organizing over the course of today. And we're delighted to welcome you all to, um, to this one in the series and very much hope that you'll be able to join some of the subsequent conversations taking place every couple of hours throughout the rest of today. Um, my name is Dominic Register. I'm a program director at Salzburg Global Seminar. And together with the Porticus Foundation, we co-convene the Whole Child Development for Displaced Learners. Um, this is an ecosystem network that started um, towards the end of last year and brings together a range of policymakers, academics, researchers, NGOs, and other practitioners, all of whom are focused on education and displacement and interested in how do we advance whole child development oriented reform. And so that will be very much the grounding for all of the conversations that we're, take, that are, we're hosting today. Um, this day of events is also part of a week long um, uh, series of conversations that Karanga, the Global Alliance for Social Emotional Learning and Life Skills is organizing. And there are many other events coming up later this week. Um, and if you're in the USA, then Friday is a big SEL in USA Day, and there are a whole series of fantastic conversations happening in different states across the US on Friday. Um, so once again, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us. This will be a very interactive session. Um, I hope very much that you um, feel free to introduce yourselves, post questions uh, for the presenters in the chat on Zoom. Um, we've got four fantastic presentations today, and each of them will speak uh, for about five to 10 minutes. There'll then be an opportunity for Q&A and discussion. And depending on how the time goes, I hope there'll be time for a collective conversation towards the end of the session. Um, so the thing that unites all of our presenters today is they're going to be focusing on assessment of whole child development, and they're going to be exploring challenges and solutions, the different kinds of data that they're collecting, the different kinds of tools that they're using, gaps that they've identified, lessons learned that they want to share with the wider community, and how do we move, how do we ensure that we can move beyond a narrow education sectoral focus when we're assessing the importance of whole child development. Um, so there are four presentations. Uh, the first presentation has been coordinated by New York University's Global Ties program, and Carly Tubbs-Dolan, who's the Deputy Director of Ties, will speak first. She'll then be followed by Evelyn Seminario, who's a consulting research scientist, and then by Karine Kalustian, uh, who's a social and emotional learning specialist with World Learning and connected to, uh, to Global Ties. Um, they'll speak for about 15 minutes. After the Ties section, we will then move to a presentation uh, from Rowan Abukadra, who's a protection and gender advisor with World Vision as part of their Syria response team. Uh, after Rowan's presentation and discussion, we'll then hear from Danielle de la Fuente, who's the um, founder and director of the Amal Alliance. Um, and then the final presenter will be Moritz Billiger, who's the acting education director for UNRWA. And then, as I said, if the time has worked in our favor, there'll be um, an opportunity for a group discussion towards the end. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna start sharing slides and welcome Carly to the stage. Perfect. Thanks so much, Dominic, and, and thanks so much to the, the organizers of this. We've been really looking forward to it. Um, so I am going to jump right in um, to talk about work we have been doing um, to strengthen educa education systems capacity for assessing social emotional skills and well-being. Um, and this is work that we have been doing in deep partnership um, in two different contexts. And so in Lebanon um, with World Learning, um, with Dr. Green, um, and with the Center for Education Research and Development, um, as well as with the Directorate General of Education, Ped Pedagogical and Scholastic Guidance Office. Um, so both within the Lebanese Ministry of Education and Higher Education. Um, Dominic, next slide. Also, um, and then with the the Peruvian government, um, and um, as as part of this, um, perfect. Thank you. Next one. 
Great. Um, and as part of this uh, research practice policy partnerships, um, we've also partnered with researchers at the University of North Carolina, um, as well as with donors, and really um, want to thank Porticus for their support through, throughout this journey. Um, so next slide. So our approach to strengthening holistic learning measurement systems, we do love mnemonics at TIES. Um, and so we've called it the TIES approach, which uh, stands for tailored. So we ensure that metrics are responsive to the unique needs and values within context. Um, and we, as much as possible in the work, we try to in really incorporate the voices of children, caregivers, teachers, and civil servants. Innovative, so we develop assessments using diverse methods, whether that's scenario-based or performance-based or surveys or observation measures, and increasingly are harnessing machine learning principles in order to test those measures um, and to do so in a way that is efficient and ensures replicability and adaptability. Um, embedded, we recognize that social emotional skills um, are shaped by and in turn shape the home, school, and community settings in which children are nested and systemic. So we really aim to align assessments with broader frameworks, curricula, resources, and infrastructure in order to promote the coherence of education systems for holistic learning. And so far, next slide, please. Um, we have seen um, that this has had some positive results, um, which, is, which is encouraging, um, but it's really taken two different pathways in these two different contexts. Um, and so at the top of the screen, you'll see a timeline of our work in Lebanon, the bottom of the screen, a timeline of our, our work in Peru. I'm just going to go through that um, much more quickly than, than it deserves. Um, and then we'll turn to, to um, Green and Evelyn to talk more about that. Um, but just to say in Lebanon, um, so the partnership with World Learning, CERD and DGE DOPS really started off on wanting to develop a measure of children's social emotional skills for use at national scale. But in doing so, back in uh, 2019, um, they identified a series of roadblocks and really namely, they lacked an evidence informed framework to guide them on which social emotional skills were most important in the Lebanese context. So in order to problem solve around that, um, we held an evidence exchange workshop um, during which the participants really um, express that they feel overwhelmed by the competing external demands placed on them um, since the start of the Syrian refugee crisis and disappointment and disillusionment in the extent to which those demands have really fulfilled the promises of improving the Lebanese education system. And given that, the participants really strongly felt that they could not use an interim measurement tool, one that was aligned with Western social and emotional skills frameworks, but might, might not be providing meaningful data in the Lebanese contexts. And so with that, we took a, a step back um, and decided to undertake a longer term collaborative and iterative process at the core that rests on developing an empirically based and contextually appropriate national social and emotional learning framework um, that would then undergird any effort to develop a social and emotional skills measure. So to do that, um, uh, participants from World Learning and from Mayhe were trained by the Harvard Easel Lab on how to code so existing social emotional learning frameworks. Um, once they coded those frameworks, we held a workshop to um, understand sort of what the landscape was of the skills being emphasized in, the, in Lebanon and identified a set of, of initial priority constructs to focus on for measurement. Um, after that, colleagues from World Learning, um, from Mehe, and from the Lebanese University really undertook to uh, define those initial set of constructs at the same time that we undertook a national qualitative study um, to really uh, understand teachers and principals' perceptions of those skills. And ultimately, um, most recently, we've selected uh, four constructs from that framework and have piloted um, a, a set of measurement tools um, in order to assess those constructs. And with the exciting news that the Minister of Education did endorse the National Social Emotional Framework in August of 2021. In Peru, slightly different path, um, but really we, we started working uh, with, with the Ministry of Education um, in June 2020, a couple months after the COVID-19 pandemic, where there was really interest in understanding what children and caregivers were going through. 
Um, and so in order to select the what skills to focus on, we, we looked at the, the Peruvian national curriculum and also considered the evidence on what skills were most important for children in a distance learning context, as well as which skills were most likely to be impacted by trauma um, and by crisis. Um, we went through a really, really fast iterative process of identifying measurement tools, adapting those measurement tools, doing a national pilot, mixed methods data collection, refining the measures, rolling it out in a national pilot. Um, and then uh, thanks to some of the, the incredible work of collaborators at the University of North Carolina, um, who have really harnessed these machine learning principles for uh, uh, psychometric analysis, we're able to rapidly turn around the data to provide metrics on how children and caregivers were doing um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that information um, was used by the then prime minister to justify uh, or to, to call for the reopening of schools um, during the pandemic also in August 2021. So the way I presented that, it sounds quite linear um, and, and straightforward, but it most certainly was not. Um, and so I am going to now ask my colleagues, Evelyn uh, and Green, or I'm gonna do it in the opposite order, Green and Evelyn. First, um, what would you say one or two major challenges were for you um, in, in throughout this process? Um, and, and feel free to reflect on any and all uh, uh, things that might come up for you. I go, Carly. Yes, please. Okay. Um, lots of things. I think, um, uh, first of all, the context in which all this is happening. And as Carly mentioned, it doesn't seem as simple as, uh, as the way it's presented. I mean, we, ha we have had multiple very serious um, contextual circumstances that have um, made it more challenging to kind of uh, um, you know, go through the whole process of doing all this. So one of them was the uprising, there was the COVID, there was the blast, uh, the Beirut blast, um, the economic deterioration and all these. But throughout the whole process, I think um, there's the, the relationship that has been developed with the ministry. I mean, everybody who has been involved um, to be able to do, to be able to, keep going on with the work because I think the way that our relationship has evolved over time as well first to say that you know the context has made it so that um, there is such a need now to to have more focus on social and emotional learning um, at so many different uh, levels um, so so there are so many things but I think one of the biggest challenges was the the major interruptions on um, on a national scale which at times felt that you know, how do we get through this? Uh, so I think that was the question. I, I went on to other things, but uh, this was probably one of the major, major challenges. Um, and sometimes the lack of engagement from the main um, stakeholders like the Center for Educational Research and Development, uh, changes in leadership, which, you know, also um, kind of sometimes interrupted the continuity of that whole process. So those were some of the challenges. Thanks, Green. Um, and Evelyn, uh, how does that resonate with you and, and your experiences throughout the Peruvian process? Yeah, thank you. Hi uh, to everybody. I think that uh, it's, it's closely related uh, to what um, happened in, in Peru. I will see like the challenges are related as our dice approach are related, with, are embedded. So I, I will see challenge in the context that almost all of these of us, um, we live together, like the COVID, uh, all the uh, like different interruptions in, in the process. But as you can see, we have a line there with a long time uh, working um, with uh, the Peruvian government. But in that moment, we, we might have like four presidents with uh, different um, a ministry of uh, education and leaders. So I think that that is like the, in the, like more broad context that was the biggest challenge, how to make this keep going with all of different uh, turnover and changes in the, in the in the leaders. Then we have like a like a um, next level that is more related to how we work with different offices uh, within the Peruvian government to align 
and uh, some of the concepts because um, this is very uh, like uh, it was very innovative but also we we need to produce the data as fast as possible because they need for making decisions so yeah, i think that it's like a kind of different to the lebanon process that start before uh, the pandemic we we start during the pandemic and finally i think that uh, another challenge is like um uh, Peru is a con is a country that doesn't have like um, internet connection. Like um, so, how can we do assessments that traditionally we, we do that in the school context, like uh, paper and pencil? So how can we transform uh, that assessments in a new way uh, to assess? And that it's also a challenge because um, we have to test. Um, and try to prove, like, uh, to test different ways to do things. And I think that that's, those were the, like, the three biggest challenges that I can see. Um, and Ev, could you say a little bit more about how we address that, that last challenge that you mentioned around the internet um, connectivity and how we were actually able to, to reach a national sample? Uh, it is, um, it is because uh, we try to do, you know, like uh, old school, uh, we call them like phone based assessments. Uh, so, but we were trying to see, we were assessing, as you uh, point out, like social emotional skills and, and well being. So, and during like a very sensitive context. So, we try uh, to do this like in a conversational style. So, people like, want to talk with us instead of you know denying that they don't want to talk with us or you know and say like no thank you but uh we 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 start to make phone calls and try to develop some hints and and clues for the numerators so they can go through the whole interview making this more um a conversational style but also scaffolding and guiding the leaker you no know, in that process because um as all of we know we have all these different options, and if I have, if somebody called me and give me, yeah, uh, like you, you have like four answers, you now from one to four, and then ask me like I don't know thirty questions about that, that we not have um, the engagement that we need. So we try to develop some scaffolding process to how to say these uh, options to improve the engagement during the phone call with caregivers and with children, because we also interview children. And just to say, um, Ev uh, developed a really amazing uh, play-based game um, on the phone for, for younger kids. Um, we have some materials on it if folks are interested, happy to share afterwards. I want to come back to just in the last few uh, 30 seconds I probably have to Green and something that said across both Ev and, and Green that you both say about the, the fluctuations in the ministry and the turnover as something that as you're working at scale and trying to do that is going to be a reality that um, I think you're going to face. What is have, what have you seen as the most successful solution to trying to navigate um, all of those that turnover and fluctuations, Green? I think the issue of turnover, especially when you are working um, with individuals um, and it's not a part of the system, is a big, big challenge. And it just so happens that in our context, um, you know, we, we tried in as much as possible to engage um, at the level of decision making, um, keeping everybody involved. I don't know if to say that we've just been very fortunate that the key individuals have kind of stayed but it's it's the consistency and communicating with them uh, creating opportunities to uh, to update to engage uh, whether it's developing the tools whether it's uh, you know discussing the the constructs so i think that consistency in a context where you have so many different things happening where the ministry is engaged in so many different projects um, was probably a very successful approach. I mean, at no point did we um, wait uh, for anything. It was always trying to come up with solutions together to be able to maintain this, um, um, maintain the whole process. Well, thank you both. Um, and for our, thank you to the partnerships for the incredible work. We were so privileged to be able to collaborate with you. Um, and so I will now turn it over back to Dominic um, for the next presenter.
Great. Thank you very much, Carly, Green, and Evelyn. That was fantastic. Um, there's a really interesting question in the chat about reference to the OECD um, Social and Emotional Skills Survey that I wonder if you could pick up and respond to in the chat. Um, and uh, yeah, fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so it now gives me enormous pleasure to invite Rowan Abukadra um, to the stage. Rowan is a protection and, protection and Gender Advisor with World Vision and part of the Syria Response Team and has a fantastic presentation lined up for us. So Rowan. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, everyone. So um, in general, I'll be focusing more on World Vision approach toward the whole child development. And indeed, like 15 minutes wouldn't be fair enough to reflect all of what uh, have been uh, led by World Vision toward the whole child development and the children well being. So that's why I'll be focusing on Syria response and specifically on Syria, Jordan, and Turkey as countries reflecting the following. Having said that, I'll be sharing the relationship reports after uh, the uh, presentation for you as a reference, which like basically were the references to that frame this conversation or this presentation, which is empowered women, empowered children, and behavioral barrier to inclusive education. But before moving uh, to the, uh, let's say, the heavy part of the presentation, let's have a question which could be like, please feel free to answer in the chat. That is reflecting the things that we could uh, miss or left out. So focusing on the assessment of whole child development from your perspective, what is usually left out? Please, uh, Dominic, next slide. Please feel free to put your answers in the chat. Okay, so um, taking into consideration indeed the time differences and uh, still we are at the beginning of the presentations. So when we are looking to the things that left out, there's a, a lot of, let's say, uh, things wouldn't be a focus from maybe the donor, wouldn't be a focus based on the analysis of the context. Sometimes we do some of the assessments in certain areas without knowing, for example, that there is other factors or other protective or risk factors affecting the children around them. So this is basically what we will be focusing on the upcoming 15 minutes to know more about two specific things, children disabilities and empowered women, how that is affecting the children. And to start with, we will be focusing on children disabilities. Uh, next slide, please, Dominic. In one of the assessments that we done in, in Nazra camp that we found clearly that parents have the power to ensure children with disabilities learn. And that was clearly indicated in the outcomes that we're focusing on the uh, family's empowerment. So the family that were having community support were able more to send their children to schools and ensure their education. From the other hand, the specialized transportation or assistant availability that also was playing a role. And finally, affording the supplies even if it's like stationary, small things to provide to the children, were also one of the things that enabled the families to send their children more to schools. Next slide. Indeed, when I'll be uh, sharing the report, you will see more about the recommendations and the analysis and what have been shared from the parents and the children themselves. But like there was a clearly indicating four key recommendations. The first one is focusing more on the support networks of parents. How could we improve them? How could we like empower these networks? How could we ensure that we are having the shared understanding of their importance? From the other side, it was like engaging directly with the children with disabilities and their parents to identify and address behavioral barriers and the challenges. Child participation and hearing directly from children is one of the empower, empowering things that we believe in, specifically when we are looking to the uh, 
context where they manage most of the um, issues around them. They are having complex, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, challenges. They are uh, witnessing things. So all of these are reflecting on our approach. Before we start implementing anything, we need to hear from them. What are the risk factors and what are the protective factors that they are seeing in front of them, which could be framed in barriers in that conversation. The third thing was addressing the disability-related bullying and the stigmatization in the communities. It's important to know the context more, to understand how they are living that. And again, connecting that with the child participation and hearing directly from the children how they are facing these challenges and barriers. And lastly, we need to ensure increasing the funding to support inclusive education in both like the camps and the host community, how these children are like facing these challenges what are the services available for them unfortunately we are facing some cases in the camps that they are not able to reach out to the schools because they are having certain challenges and that is like just to quickly in a nutshell focusing on the children disabilities and how that is connected directly with their rights for education and the protection Mo Moving forward for the next slide, please. Um, moving forward to know more about the women empowerment. And that was one of the uh, analysis and the surveys that have been done in Turkey, Jordan, and Syria. We were looking in what is the relation of women empowerment and the child well-being. And it was a clear indicator, for example, that the size, even the family size is affecting what the, the children are getting. So the children with poor diet, uh, with poor diet were most of the time in families that having nine people and more. From the other hand, if you are looking to uh, the uh, illiterate women, it was also one of the things that reflected in the enrollment of schools. So if the women are not having or completing their primary and secondary education, we were having 67% of the children are not enrolled in schools. From the other hand, we were also having only 14% of these children with good mental well-being. As also with women with lower secondary education, we were having increased percentages of their children enrollment and their mental well-being. As of mothers without GBV experience, it was also related to the children mental well-being. So we were having high mental well-being with the children up to 80% when the women themselves, they are not not facing these challenges as also of the high self-esteem up to 79% and also positive learning attitude in 88% where from the other hand and the opposite, if the women are suffering or experiencing GBV, experience, uh, GBV concerns, they were having the opposite outcomes with their children. And if we are looking at it like this is could be logical, but maybe we need to think about it more. Like these children are witnessing these concerns. They are witnessing the effect on their mothers. Their mothers are overwhelmed with what's happening with them and they may be doing the same to, to their children. Next slide, please. As of also, just to, to wrap up quickly, the uh, idea of the women empowerment and the children well-being correlations, it was also important for us to look further into how much these mothers are controlling time. Are they able to know exactly when they need to do some of the things, when they need to choose some of the things to be done in the same household? And that was related to the the children themselves and how much they are exposing to violence. So we found that 38% of the children unexposed to violence when the mothers with no control over time, while 63 of them, 63% of them could be exposed to violence with mothers who doesn't have any control over time. While also it was clearly that these things with the increasing the mother control over time, it was obvious that the violence is, is decreasing over children. And as of the self-esteem, the mothers with low self-esteem was directly 
reflecting that 67% of their children were having the same and low, uh, low socio-ecological resilience as of. From the other hand, the mothers with high self-esteem, they were having 89% of their children showed high socio-ecological resilience. And that, again, goes to the learning attitude, how they are thinking about schools, how they are able to send their children to schools, and in addition of how they are empowering their children and learning them new skills and the new uh, coping mechanisms. And lastly, to wrap up how we are looking into that, it was like that restriction of movement. If we are looking to the camps where the mothers are living, there is certain camps and certain areas of the, um, like of Syria, where the women are not allowed to move freely. And this is a case, but also we are having in certain families in Jordan and Turkey, where the mothers are not able to leave their house or they have they are under restrictions of movement regardless if it's like from the domestic restrictions or from their like let's say the same close family it was also in the in like related to the diet of the children and with the mental well-being of them in addition of their acceptance to be exposed to violence. And in front of you, you can see that the percentages, but it was like clearly showing us the mother who's having the free freedom of movement, 65% of their children were in a good diet, 55% in a good mental well-being, and 34% are the children, or uh, apologies, 59% are the children unexposed to violence. And again, if we are looking to all of that, that is connecting us with the system approach around the children. This is what we need to make sure every time when we are looking to any kind of assessment for the children well-being, the whole child development, to know more about how they, these children are living and what is affecting them. And lastly, if uh, there is any question, otherwise, over to you, Dominic. Uh, there was a, a question in response to your question in the chat, Ryan, from Rajani um, about students with disabilities and the extent to which they are mainstreamed in assessment whether you have time to just pick that one up. Yeah, so the question is, are students with disability mainstreamed in general education or are they separate classroom? If they were mainstreamed, what kind of accommodation were done so are fully participating and interacting with the content? Many thanks, Rajayim, for the question. Actually, the idea that we are seeking most of the time that these children to be mainstreamed in the same education system, but adapted one. So we need to look into the physical and the social barriers that the children are facing and ensure that we are overcome them. So we start with like the physical barriers and how they can access then what specific tools they need. Of Unfortunately, in the analysis we've done, and you will see in the report that I will be sharing that we faced a lot of these challenges in the camps, as even the box themselves were not available for children with visual impairment or disabilities. So it was also challenging for them. If I can enter the school, I don't have the, um, the proper tools to use or the proper uh, trainings that are provided for the teachers to deal with these the children. So it was like very challenging for these children to get the education inside the camps. But what we tried to do in that analysis and reflected in multiple uh, events as the Nolos generation and other, we tried to make sure that we are highlighting all of the recommended needs for these children, what we need to look at. And indeed, like the asks for donors to make sure that whenever we are looking into education for children, we need to make sure that protection, whole child development are taken into consideration. Brilliant, Brian. Thank you so much for your presentation and sharing all about your work with the group today. Um, it now gives me enormous pleasure to invite Daniel de la Fuente to the stage. Daniel is the founder and executive director of the Amal Alliance. 
Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. I'm delighted to be with you here today. Um, I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background as to what it is that we do, um, and then also how what our assessment approach, um, as well as some of the top challenges and solutions that we've come across. Um, so in general, Amal Alliance provides four pillars of support to displace and disenfranchise children um, in refugee camps, as well as urban settings, and more recently in uh, formal school settings as well. We focus on social emotional learning, psychosocial support, early childhood development, and peace education. And today I'm really gonna focus on our Colors of Kindness program and our assessment journey that uh, we've gone through. So Colors of Kindness was actually a pivot during the pandemic. And it was born out of UNHCR's Humanitarian Education Accelerator Challenge. And so what we did is we took our traditional social and emotional learning curriculum and applied it to this ed tech modality where you have a podcast um, as well as a digital workbook. And it's delivered in a hybrid approach. So you do have classroom settings, but it also lives on this ed tech platform. So this was our first time really in the technology realm with education, which posed all sorts of different hurdles on how to assess the program's efficacy, um, as well as just a learning curve um, in general. So during the pandemic um, and peak pandemics, August, 2020, we piloted in Bangladesh. We were actually really fortunate to work with our colleagues from NYU Global Ties um, on this call to really fine tune what measurements we were gonna use to implement this program. Um, it was deployed as an emergency program. So it was a really quick turnaround around 30 days. So we didn't have much time to really validate the tools. It was more just to understand what we needed to measure, how we were gonna do it and how we were gonna best um, conduct it. And so at the time we were using a learning management system that worked offline because it was in Bangladesh and many times there's not internet connectivity. So we really wanted to ensure that it was easy to, to apply, but also just easy to collect the data if in case the internet went out. And so at this point, um, we saw phenomenal results. We had seen about a 16.5 increase in the well-being of the kids. And so how did we actually assess that? Because Colors of Kindness is skills-based, what we did is we divided up what we were teaching as particular skills. And then we used pre and post surveys. Um, and actually, Dominic, could you uh, go to the next slide, please? So we, we use this holistic m and approach. So um, it's 360 views. So we're looking at the teacher, the parent, the student, but also just measuring if the program is working because we have this continuous loop to understand if the content is good, if it needs to be changed, um, and, then, and then obviously change that. So we had pre and post teacher assessments, um, which looked at the teacher's background, as well as pre and post teacher assessments for each student. Um, and then we engage the parents with a pre and post survey, although in the Bangladesh um, iteration, we only did this as a final assessment, but that has changed since. And, um, and then the students as well through a pre and post questionnaire, as well as with our emotions thermometer to check their mood, um, as well as just positive outlook. And so um, this was all administered in Bangladesh. It focused on the skills and then it, um, and then all the different data points were there correlated to understand were the children increasing their social and emotional competencies? If so, what was going more towards resilience or as I mentioned, mood or positive outlook? And then with all of those different data points, we could measure, we can understand if there was an improvement in their well being at large. As you can imagine with social and emotional learning, there's so many nuances that don't often come across in surveys. So that's one of the hurdles I'm going to be discussing in a bit because the, the quantitative data is very important, but the qualitative data is also equally as important to understand what's happening in and outside of the classroom. Some of those things that the surveys aren't picking up on. Are the parents noticing if their children are more cooperative at home? Perhaps they're you know, playing better with their siblings or with neighbors. And these little things sometimes cannot be captured in a survey. So from our first iteration in Bangladesh, We've now moved into um, an evidence-based pilot, which we're really fortunate to be working with the Ministry of Education, as well as um, in, with many NGO settings in Greece to really understand how we can, um, the, the, if the program is working, if it can be scaled, but also 
what are we measuring and is it leading towards sort of a holistic whole child development of quality holistic learning? So some of the main challenges that we've come across, um, and there's many more, but I've kind of highlighted the top five, um, is language. So for instance, in Greece, so now the second iteration is in Greece, you might have children from six or seven different backgrounds in one classroom. So they all speak a different language, but yet they're supposed to be learning in, in Greek, which is the, the official language of the ministry. So now you have an issue of our children actually understanding what is being delivered, but also what we're asking them to respond to. We have the issue of teacher burnout. You know, teachers are already so overwhelmed with all of the things happening with the pandemic. It's really not fair to say, okay, well, here, conduct a class and then spend, you know, 30 to 40 minutes filling out surveys once you're done. So this is a really critical point because one, teachers really need to understand what it is that we're measuring and why, which is why the training process is so important, because if they understand why it is that we're measuring, why it's important, then they're more actively involved in the, the M&E process um, and they're more apt to do it. But this actually leads to another issue that's um, on here is the simplification of questions. Oftentimes, some of these universal um, sort of evidence-based surveys are extremely lengthy. And um, this is our first time sort of working with an evidence base. So we're, we're just trying to understand why some of these questions are so lengthy because then it becomes tedious and nobody wants to sit there and respond to 47 questions that might be difficult to grasp. So the simplification of questions is key. They need to be simple, straightforward, something that can be easily translated that doesn't get lost in the translation. Um, and then we have the challenge of safeguarding. So are we uh, looking at protection? Are we ethically using the data? Are we ensuring that privacy is maintained and all of it is unidentified data so it can't be traced back to the child? Um, and lastly, our biggest issue has actually been attrition of children on the move. So because you have constant movement, how do you account for the fact that not all of the kids will be present throughout the entire program? So if you know you have children coming in, children coming out, how do you measure that? How do you understand if, um, if they were only there perhaps a few weeks, was the program beneficial? Um, were they able to leave with you know, a strong grasp of self-management or self-awareness? Um, or was it just a passerby situation? And so all of that needs to be taken into account. So currently we're working with the Harvard ESA lab and we focused mostly on this last point on the attrition with, uh, with the children in constant movement because it's really difficult to see where we're at or what the change was done if you have this constant rotation. So what we've done is we have sort of a revolving measurement system. And so this is very important that the teachers have a very strong grasp as to how they're going to implement the assessments or else it gets lost sort of in, in the program. And, and so we have a, a pre and post, but also an exit. So as children are coming in and out, they have to onboard them and then also account for where they left. Now, oftentimes there's no, you know, there's no notice of, you know, a child has left. It might be that now it's been two weeks and the child hasn't come back. And we need to, um, and we need to account to the fact that the child has long likely left. Um, but there has to be a very strong system to be able to account for that. So we have you know, a spreadsheet that notes when kids are coming in, when they're coming out, um, speaking to the safeguarding measures, every child is assigned an ID number. So we have no data within their names, nothing that is identifiable. And so all of that gets passed on through the learning management system to our um, you know, research partners, but then there's only one master of the key and then the, the information is protected. So a few things that I haven't listed here that I think are important challenges to touch upon is parental engagement. Not every context is the same. Some contexts, like in Bangladesh, we had no problem reaching the families. Um, they were very eager to participate in surveys or focus groups. Um, but in Greece, for example, we've, we've struggled with, um, with parental engagement. There's already so many other things going on that it, the education of their children, it's not that it's not important, but it's just a, it's a more, they don't necessarily have time to engage with all these surveys or they're hard to reach. 
Um, and it varies by location and obviously whatever relationship perhaps an NGO already has with the parents. But their input is critical because that's what really ties the classroom back to the home life. Um, so we do an extra sort of measures to, to, to get there. Internet connectivity. No matter where we work, we always face issues with connectivity, and which is why we opt for offline learning management systems. But at the same time, we have a digital program. So fortunately, it works offline. But these are things to keep in mind because they still have to be transferred over to the cloud. So at some point or another, you do need to have either a hotspot or some form of internet connectivity to transfer that data over and to ensure that that data isn't lost. Um, and now improvement. So for instance, when we were trying to get our program approved with the ministry, we needed to ensure that the questions we were asking were okay. Were they, they, were they relevant in this context? Were they appropriate? But also was it gonna fall under the scientific um, standards that were gonna give us approval to be able to conduct our assessments? And lastly, child participation. So this is actually unrelated to our Colors of Kindness program, but I think it speaks to our first challenge, which is language. Um, and so in, in Turkey, pre-pandemic, we faced another issue, which was illiteracy. So we wanted to make sure that children were taken into account, that we were asking them questions. And so we used an emoji-based um, survey. But the issues with that were that children started copying each other, seeing, oh, okay, well, you filled out this emoji, I'm gonna use the same. So it wasn't really an accurate reflection of what was happening in the classroom. So since then, we've sort of changed it to a emoji slash uh, verbiage of what, um, what we're trying to account for. But again, language is an issue. So at the moment, a lot of the teachers will sort of have to sit with the child or with some translator to explain what they're being asked. But at the same time, it kind of forces a, a bit of a bias because now the teacher's involved um, and, and it may not necessarily affect the, the response, but it's a different added layer to consider. And so I'm going to move on to the next slide, please, Dominic. I have some guided questions um, and I would very much love to make this interactive. So if you have any questions in general, please go ahead and, and put them in, in the chat box, but I'll, I'll read them out. Um, so how do you go about prioritizing and addressing needs in your context? And how important is it to localize assessments for varying contexts? And the last one is what are the benefits of collecting both quantitative and qualitative data? And um, I'll give a few points um, myself as maybe to give some time for individuals to put some questions in the chat, but I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to understand the needs of the context. We, um, we like to use the tool that um, the Harvard ESA Lab and INEE created um, to understand the needs assessments. Um, they have this fantastic tool. If you haven't checked it out, it's in their toolkit. And it's wonderful because it has tons of questions. Um, you don't necessarily need to answer all of them, but it gives you a really, really solid background as to what, how to go about doing a needs assessment. And if you understand the needs of your context, then you can actually really make sure that the, the content is localized and the assessments are localized because that will make a, a difference entirely. And I'm seeing some questions. Um, Danielle, there's a question here for you um, from Dinu. Okay. Were there any interventions done with the teachers on their emotional thermometer so that they could be empowered to help the children? What kind of interventions were done? So we didn't actually use the emotion thermometers with the teachers, but that's a really good idea. Um, so we've done we've used the emotion thermometers in two ways. So in Bangladesh, we had it on the learning management system. And since there were smaller classes, we had about six to seven children per class. The, the teacher and the student would just input, you know, where they were feeling at in their emotions. And, um, and then that data would go straight to the cloud. In Greece, we've done it a little bit differently because the classes are long, larger and it would be incredibly boring for children to wait as everyone filled it in. So we have printed them out um, as black and white emotions thermometers so children can color in what they're feeling, but also just uh, use it as an art activity. But we haven't engaged the teachers in that except the fact that now they're facilitating the emotions thermometer and they collect them. And some teachers have made sort of picture books of the emotions thermometer, which is kind of exciting. Um, 
And then the second part of your question, what kind of interventions were done? So with the teachers, we focused predominantly on um, the same things that we're asking of the children. So really to see it from their perspective necessarily of what, how they see that these skills have improved pre and post. But, um, and then obviously we train them on uh, not only how to, to implement the program, but also how to um, do the assessments and ensure that we're collecting that feedback. We do do focus groups with them um, so that they're, they're very much involved in the design implementation and then sort of um, iterative process so we can better the program. So I do think they feel that they find agency in that by providing ways that we can improve it um, or you know things that might not be working or that are working really well. And I see... Uh, Rowan, Empowered Women. Okay. Anything else in the chat that I might be missing? No. There's there's nothing in there at the moment, but if there's um if there's no one from the audience who aren't on the panelists who are um who have some responses to these questions, I actually wanted to see if Carly um or Evelyn might want to speak to the third question, what are the benefits of collecting both uh, quantitative or qualitative data from our experience? Uh, sure, I'm, I'm happy to weigh. <laughs> Uh, weigh in quickly on that. Um, and so I think um, the benefits, uh, I mean, huge, but I think what, what we've, we've seen them being used in a number of different ways. One is to really understand, I think, to um, Danielle's, uh, Danielle's uh, first question, the importance of using that data, the qualitative data to prioritize and assess the needs in the context and not just prioritize and assess, but then also define using the voices of children, caregivers, teachers. Um, we also, especially in sort of the mixed methods, qualitative and quantitative approach in the measure development process to really make sure first that like the items themselves are representative of the language that, that people are using and are familiar um, at, at, the, at one level, two, to make sure that um, you're capturing the full sort of set of things that self-regulation or, or self-regulated learning or emotional awareness really means in that culture and context. And then to be able to triangulate that with the actual um, quantitative responses. And so we found both like that set of information to be helpful both in the definition framework process and throughout the measure development and testing process. And if we have a little bit more time, I'm actually wondering if Rowan can answer the second question, because I think that this is something that's come up quite a bit in her work as well, of how important is it to localize assessments for varying contexts? I don't know, Rowan, if you're available to jump in. I can imagine maybe we lost uh, one due to connectivity issues. I'm not sure though. Yeah, I think that's possible. Okay, I was I was hoping to just pull in some folks from the panel because I know we all do quite a bit of thinking on this. Um, but Danielle, I'll let you continue on. Well, I just wanted to mention one thing um, in response to Dinu's question. So when we do our teacher trainings, we actually have an entire module on self-care. And I think it's really, really speaks to the fact that teachers are extre extremely burned out. They have a lot on their plates and, and we always tell them it's like the airplane, you know, you have to put on your mask first before you can put on somebody else's mask. And I think whether we're talking about assessments or programming, we really need to take that into account as we're designing assessments, as we're thinking about it, because if teachers are in a place that they're feeling empowered to help the children to conduct those assessments, all of that's gonna come out in, um, in the results. And so I think it's just super important that to note that it's all interconnected. So um, I just wanted to highlight that, but I think that's all I was gonna talk about. So if we don't have any other questions, um, I'm happy to delve into a little bit more of these guiding questions, but, um, or pass it along to our next, next speaker. Why don't we um, move on to Moritz? 
his presentation. And then I think some of the localization questions may well come up in the general chat at the end. So Danielle, thank you so much for sharing all of that about the process that Amal goes through, as well as some of the assessment challenges that you've encountered and some of the solutions. Um, I'd now love to invite the final presenter for this round table, uh, Moritz Billiger, who's the Acting Director of Education for UNRWA. So Moritz, Thank you so much, uh, Dominic, and, and thanks, Danielle, and the other presenters. That's really interesting stuff and, and really something that uh, I think uh, one learns a lot from, from uh, one another's experiences. Uh, yeah, Dominic, I understand that you're, you'll be the, the slide master, so uh, every so, so many seconds, I'll kind of request you to um, to move them. Uh, just for those of you that are not familiar with UNRWA, we are a UN agency. We're actually one of the oldest uh, UN agencies that exist. We have been founded in uh, 1948 and, and became operational from 1949. And currently, uh, and, and, and so our mandate is to take care of the humanitarian needs of uh, Palestine refugee fields in what we call our five fields of operation, which are the West Bank, Gaza, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And currently, um, so education being the biggest program, we are serving uh, around 550,000 uh, school students, around 8,000 uh, TVET students, which is obviously technical and, and vocational education and training, uh, and around 2,000 university level uh, teacher tra trainees, uh, with 20,000 education staff overall, of which around 17,000 uh, teachers, so you can imagine that it's quite an operation. Uh, if we go to the next slide, Dominic, then <clears throat> I just very briefly like to talk about what we talk about. Uh, what you know, uh, we of course want to assess the quality of our education in line with SDG four, you know, Sustainable Development Goal four. But as the majority of you will be uh, familiar with, um, SDG four stipulates quality education for all but doesn't necessarily say what quality education uh, means. And, and interestingly, when you uh, look at a lot of the discourse around uh, assessing the quality of education, what people are actually talking about is learning. But I would like to emphasize that for UNRWA, in, uh, you know, of course, uh, learning is, is important and, and we recognize that this is the ultimate goal of education, but this is not sufficient for uh, for quality education. We believe that quality education consists or responds rather to four main criteria. The first of those criteria is relevance. You know, the kind of teaching and learning that is going on in our schools, uh, TVET centers and uh, universities should be relevant to the socioeconomic development needs of the community. I myself grew up in the Netherlands. I went to a school that was called a gymnasium in and some of the stuff that we learned was uh, Latin and Old Greek. And I have to say that that was very interesting. But if you ask me the question, uh, is uh, Old Greek what the Palestine refugees need nowadays for their own socioeconomic development needs? And my answer would probably be no. And so, so, so this really for us is a first test of, uh, of quality of education. What is relevant? What does the uh, community need to be able to advance? And, and we're formulating two main answers to that. We believe that uh, you know technology is ubiquitous. Uh, ICTs are very important. So we are trying to introduce through our ICT for Education strategy, ICT as a means of education, as a means of delivery of education, but also as a subject of education. And something else that we believe is very important is uh, human rights, conflict resolution, and tolerance education, which is not a luxury in a region uh, where tolerance uh, is, is a scarce commodity and conflict is not a scarce commodity. <clears throat> but relevance is not enough for quality of education. Of course, it's also uh, important for us that uh, education is effective. And when we talk about effectiveness, then we're mainly talking about learning. So when we're talking about learning assessment, we're uh, you know, measuring the effectiveness dimension of our conceptualization of the quality of education. Again, this is not sufficient for quality of education. We also want our education to be efficient. That means that we want to keep the wastage to a, a minimum and we monitor and evaluate uh, that, uh, let's say, axis of what we call quality of education through our educational planning mechanisms and our emesses, you know, 
of course, refers to an education management uh, information system. And finally, we say that if learning occurs, if our education is efficient, and if it's relevant, then it still has to pass this final test before we can, uh, you know, rubber stamp it as quality education. And it is well being and inclusion of learners. We want our learners to uh, do well and to feel well in our schools. And of course, uh, for the Palestine refugee community, that is not always easy, but with the help of generous donors such as GIZ uh, and also the Belgian uh, government, GIZ being, of course, a German development organization, we are making significant efforts to, uh, to work in the field of psychosocial uh, support. But of course, but of course, learning is a sine qua non for quality. And so our agency has assessed it since 2009. Dominic, maybe we can go to the next slide <clears throat> so that I can um, tell you something about that. We used to have MLAs, those were monitoring uh, of learning assessment uh, studies, which were doing measurements in grade four and eight uh, in maths and Arabic. They have been conducted periodically since 2009. You can see that the um, you know, periodicity has varied a little bit uh, between 2009 and 2013. There were four years, then there were three years until 2016. And we've conducted our latest study in 2021. Actually, it was due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but that meant a five-year gap. But going forward, we want to reduce the periodicity to two or three years. Now, what did we see in terms of data? Well, according to the 2016 study, over half of students were performing at the achieved level in grades four and eight agency-wide uh, in Arabic, and the same count for grade four in mathematics. Now, the achieved level is everything that's above the unsatisfactory level, so um, it's not it's not it's not fantastic. Let, let's say it like that. Uh, however, what we did find was particularly strong achievement in Syria and strong achievement in Gaza as well. And that was, of course, surprising because, as you can imagine, uh, or as you know, rather, Syria is a field that has been under a lot of stress, uh, and particularly conflict-related stress. Uh, we did still see a gender uh, gap uh, in favor of girls. That's not uh, surprising. I think that reflects many of the international uh, large-scale assessments, although this has narrowed since uh, 2013. And, and of course, that gap was, well, not of course, but that gap was stronger in Arabic than in, uh, in mathematics. Uh, if we then go to the <clears throat> following slide, I just very briefly like to uh, tell you uh, about uh, what we have done in uh, or, or last year. Um, <clears throat> we thought we need to make a few tweaks to the way that we were assessing learning. In the first place, we were only assessing learning and not uh, factors associated with learning. And what we decided to do this time around is not just to look at whether learning occurred, but also under which uh, circumstances. So we renamed our MLA to ALOSAF, ALOSAF meaning Assessment of Learning Outcomes in Study uh, of Associated Factors. Um, and the way that we conceptualized it was with uh, uh, you know, stuffle beams, SIG model, you know, context input uh, process and product model that you're probably familiar with. I, I put it, you know, as an ad memoir on the right side of the slide. And, and for those of you that are not familiar with it, what this kind of says is that there's three clusters of factors with which learning can be associated and that they can also interact uh, among themselves. Context, you know, is uh, those things that we can't uh, do a lot about. You know, we consider, for example, socioeconomic situation uh, of the family, part of the uh, part of the context. I'm not saying it can't be changed, but it is difficult to change. And we know, of course, from studies such as uh, Hattie's, but of course, also from the, you know, or studies rather, it was a meta analysis, but also, you know, studies uh, such as OCD PISA, uh, that uh, socioeconomic background is the strongest predictor by far of learning, uh, learning achievements. Uh, cultural capital is part of context. We also consider gender part of context, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But context in any case is something that's difficult to change. Then <clears throat> input is all of the things that we can do from a 
policy side uh, to strengthen education so we can increase the number of teachers you know we can uh, improve the qualifications of teachers uh, we can give more computers to schools we can improve you know the physical infrastructure inputs or all of these kind of things that we can buy uh, as it were if we only we had sufficient funds and of course within this cluster we know that uh, you know teacher quality which by the way is an expression that i really don't like very much because i don't think we should talk about quality of human beings but um, you know uh, let's say teacher ability uh, is known as the strongest factor in this cluster of inputs and then finally we've got uh, the cluster factor of process that i think many of you are familiar with that are all the things that you really can't touch uh, as it were you know that is uh, school climate, uh, school leadership style, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, et cetera. And, and here, school climate, as a matter of fact, uh, has been noted as one of the uh, most important factors predicting quality of education in the studies of the laboratorio uh, that many of you are familiar with in, in Latin America, that is managed by UNESCO uh, Santiago, and, and that is conducting periodic uh, studies uh, mainly with uh, Miruse uh, in Chile and, and other uh, regional institutions. And all of these factors and clusters of factors that in, uh, you know, um, what is it, the impact uh, on the product, which is which is learning. So, so we thought, let's really map this out this time so that we can also intervene from a policy perspective and, and, and uh, and, and see what kind of factors we can somehow fine tune in order to uh, improve the quality of education. So that's something that we did for the first time in uh, you know last year. We also made this uh, sample based. You know, looked at fifteen percent of schools, which were also like more or less fifteen percent of the student populations, rather than going with the census uh, based approach that we had the last times. And <laughs> this time we also looked at grades uh, five and nine because of the fact that in, in you know of course with the challenges related to, to, to COVID-19 and uh, what we said was that uh, learning achievement at the end of grade four and eight is similar to the learning achievement at the beginning of grades uh, five and nine so, so because we couldn't anymore uh, measure learning achievement uh, at the end of grade four and eight, we were too late in the year for that. We said, let's measure grade five and nine, uh, assuming that that will be equivalent to grade four and eight achievements if we do it sufficiently early on in the year. And that will then allow us to uh, generate time series uh, data. If we then go, I think, to what I think is the last slide that I'd like to share with you. <clears throat> um, just talking about some of the challenges that we uh, were facing of course there were many of them um, you know that uh, of course we had uh, the incursions in gaza last year uh, the conflict in syria is not uh, finished as, as some of our participants in lebanon uh, will know that country has been going through an economic uh, meltdown uh, jordan is battling uh, poverty uh, the west bank is battling uh, so several other challenges, etc. But I don't want to talk about them. One thing that we were wondering about was also how to assess uh, learning loss, uh, because you know if we uh, develop time series data, then, then we can of course look at the previous trends and then interpret any break in the trends uh, as or attributed to 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 learning loss due to the COVID nineteen pandemic. But methodologically, of course, that's questionable, but uh, the two challenges that I'd like to highlight uh, are um, number one, that UNRWA is teaching the host country curriculum in our fields of operation. So for example, uh, in Syria, we, we teach the Syrian curriculum. Uh, in Lebanon, we teach the Lebanese uh, curriculum, etc. Then of course, we have to ensure that the content of those curricula aligns with United Nations positions and UNESCO uh, standards so that somehow take some kind of uh, you know tweaks but how can we then arrive at uh, you know constructs and concepts that are somehow um, equally representative or similarly representative across the fields of operation and the kind of solution that, that that we found to that which of course was not a new solution that we faced this time was simply to use 
the same approach as international uh, large-scale assessments do, and that is developing these uh, dummy tables uh, that we're all familiar with, I guess, with, uh, you know, like uh, content uh, categories and, uh, and performance uh, uh, expectations. Uh, and in this way, we mapped all of the uh, curricula of the different host countries. Uh, we then calculated, uh, you know, dummy tables uh, that, that were representative of the whole, uh, of all of the, the, the host country curricula, and then developed these UNRWA tests. So, so that was quite interesting. We don't have an UNRWA curriculum as such, but when you look at what we were measuring through those tests, it was or is to an extent a reflection of what one could call like a virtual UNRWA, uh, UNRWA uh, curriculum. The second challenge that I'd briefly like to highlight is that UNRWA, uh, due to a number of circumstances, has had uh, real financial uh, challenges over the past few years particularly. And of course, that requires a detailed analysis in order to develop a, a protocol that would be feasible for us to, to implement and so that we could uh, implement uh, the study this year as in the previous years. And what we actually wanted to do as a solution was to, uh, for the first time, administer uh, this uh, test uh, on a computer basis. So we use like the computer uh, labs um, and I see that I, I'm up against time, so, so let me not go into the details of this, but just to say that uh, for a number of reasons, we finally decided to implement the test uh, you know, on a pen and paper basis uh, anyway, and we managed uh, somehow to do so uh, financially. I think that that's what I've got. I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview of how we uh, you know, uh, uh, um, approach the issue of uh, assessing the quality of education in in UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine and Refugees in the Near East. And with that, uh, thank you very much, this organization, for giving us uh, you know, this, uh, this stage and uh, return the floor back to yourself, uh, Dominic. Thank you very much. Moritz, thank you so much for that. That was fascinating and fantastic. Um, if anyone has any specific questions for Moritz, now is the time to jump in. Otherwise, we're going to open it up to a general conversation between all of the panelists. So I'm going to take the slides down. You've got everyone's email addresses there. If you'd like to um, contact them outside of this session, I know that they're all um, very willing to answer specific questions that maybe you haven't wanted to bring up in the discussion. So let me leave that up for a second. And then, um, Carly, I'd love to start with an opening question to you, if that's OK, around, you know, with all the work and the different geographies, in which ties operates and works and supports other local organizations. How do you decide what needs to be measured or how do you decide what to measure in whole child development contexts? And then we'll bring any other panelists in who'd like to contribute answers to that right. as well. Thanks, and uh, thanks for the great question. Um, I think for us, it really starts with what is the purpose of assessment? So we like to say measurement for what? Um, and I think that is the guiding uh, principle that then sort of helps us decide what to focus on in what context. And I think one of somebody brought up in the chat the question about the OECD um, social and emotional skills panel. Um, and I think that really it helps illustrate sort of um, that principle of measurement for what were really the purpose of that was to do cross context cross country comparisons and so those skills were selected based on evidence of in part based on evidence of cross uh, country comparability. I think in the work that we're doing in Peru and Lebanon really the goal of it is is national monitoring so during the COVID pandemic how um, are children and caregivers doing in Peru and Lebanon during the revolution and the economic crisis and COVID? How are children and caregivers doing? And so it's less about sort of cross con contextual comparisons and more about providing that information that is is um, really immediately necessary for policymakers. And so that has really helped us, um, I think, as an initial step, decide what to measure, but then um, going from there and taking into account the, the sort of unique needs and um, uh, priorities of, of folks in context. Thank you, Carly. Would anyone else like to come in with any additional experiences around 
um, the extent to which it's a consultative process with local communities or with the assessment population. Otherwise, I'd love to bring in another question then, which, um, and for everyone who's in the audience, as it were, please feel free to put questions in the chat. We've got a, a kind of amazing um, opportunity to tap into the collective intelligence of all of the speakers here who have an amazing wealth of experience of assessment of this topic in different contexts. One of the things that I, I know lots of people who work um, in old child development or social and emotional learning grapple with with regards to assessment is the kind of acceptable time frame for showing progress and development in this, that it can't just be a kind of end of term snapshot because so many factors can go into how you emotionally present at any point in time. And would love to get your different experiences about what you found to be an acceptable, reasonable, fair time frame for demonstrating um, development and growth um, with students or teachers that you're working with, with these kind of whole child development approaches. Very happy for anyone to go first with that. Otherwise, I'll just, Danielle, thank you for unmuting. <laughs> I'm happy to jump in. So in, in the initial stage that we implemented Colors of Kindness, we did it in a 10 week program. And we, we didn't think we were going to see as strong results as we had because it was only 10 weeks. Um, but I think the fact that we had such strong positive results was an indicator that a long-term program would be much more beneficial. So in the second iteration, we've actually aligned it to the academic semester. So we have a 16 week program. Um, and it would be really interesting just to even see the results of 10 weeks versus 16 weeks, how, how that differs. But I think what's really missing in assessments that's large, especially in social and emotional learning is revisiting perhaps, you know, three months after or six months after to see if some of those skills persisted um, or, you know, the retention needs to be, you know, more classes need to are needed. Um, but I do think that any semblance of even the kids that kind of come into the program and leave any semblance of SEL, even if it's in short bursts, is helpful. So I think it's just understanding the different aspects and, and what's feasible because, you know, there might not be an opportunity to have, you know, a one-year SEL program. So, you know, micro dosages are also welcome. Thanks, Danielle. Other reflections or experience on, on time frame? Um, i happy to also just um, uh, jump in on the, the question in the chat there on, on conducting longitudinal studies um, at this time, because I think that's related where I think um, that's one of the big challenges, particularly in crisis context, is trying to collect that longitudinal um, data and follow the same children over time, um, given just the population mobility um, and some of the infrastructure challenges. And so one of the things in, in the work in Peru that has really enabled the work is fundamentally this, this government ministry um, system of unique identifiers for each child so that potentially you can link children over time and explore sort of those trajectories of skills and things like that. And, and without that, that's it's really, really hard to do on a large scale. Um, I think there is some work from colleagues um, uh, at Global Ties in Cox's Bazaar, um, which is it's just starting a, a large scale longitudinal study. Um, and so happy to, to share the information of those folks as well, but it just to say it is a big, big challenge. Thank you, Carly. Uh, Ron. Yeah, just I wanted to mention and complementing what Carly and Daniel was mentioning that it's important to take into consideration which, in which context we are working and what other services are available for the children. Again, when we are looking to the children, it's important to know that there is other factors than the program itself affecting their uh, social emotional learning. So it's important to take all of these into consideration. And yes, usually the rule as much as like the program is holistic and uh, long, it will be benefiting the children, but also sometimes like some surprise results coming up, as Daniela mentioned. Thank you, Ryan. Evelyn. 
Um, I, I was thinking like uh, to connect your first question and your second question uh, um, since like uh, it's like once more like measuring measuring for what you know we, you can have like the monitoring system at scale you know, and they don't necessarily need to uh, develop like a standard of rowing they just need to inform the governments or to policymakers like a, a snapshot. You know, like the thermometer of how the country is going or what, which are the biggest needs or requirements so they can build uh, uh, some answers to improve things. And other things are like, this is like a more systemic way uh, because uh, to understand um, um, measurement as skill. And there is another interesting, of course, uh, as researchers, but also thinking in programming, uh, to follow up and to follow kids to see the trajectories of your lives. So we can tailor better our programs, we can um, understand the changes and the fluctuations of social emotional skills during lifespan. But I think that uh, once more, we need to know like which is the main interest of our collaborators, but also in which context or, or where are going to uh, nested our assessments or metrics. So if it is like a, mon a monitoring process, I think like these standards will be not necessary because they need the percentage of kids that are like having internalizing symptoms or the percentage of kids that can regulate their sex or things like that. No, so I was I was thinking in the both, both questions. Yeah, I completely agree. That, I mean, the, there's also the kind of definitional challenge that that speaks to, isn't there? That, social and emotional learning can be very, very broadly defined. So that sort of means a, a little bit of everything and at the same time, not really um, enough of any one thing to give um, useful or valid measurements. There's a, a really great question has just come up in the chat um, around, I suppose, for all of you, how optimistic you might feel or whether you think it's desirable, whether you think we will see social and emotional learning kind of fully embedded uh, in system assessment um, structures and whether that's uh, desirable. It could be an open question to any of you. That does feel like a direction of travel at the moment that it's becoming more and more mainstream. I think there's maybe, I mean, Mariah, if you'd be happy to unmute and say a little bit more about your question, um, particularly the, the traditional academic assessment part of it and whether that means a sort of high stakes end of term type test on social and emotional learning or whether you were thinking about it just being mainstreamed in the system. Moritz, you're welcome to come in while Mariah's. Yeah, sorry, no, I, I think it's a very interesting question and, um, you know, it's, it's a discussion that, that I had in, in, uh, in Mexico. Uh, you know, uh, around five, six years ago with uh, Felipe Martinez Rizzo, who was one of the specialists of uh, educational assessment all, all, all over there. And I said, you know, we should expand, you know, and have got a larger number of things that we're measuring in, in education measurements. And he said, no, we should focus on, on, on the basics. Uh, I think there's two things that uh, can and should be said about that. And, and I think the first thing is that uh, what you measure is, is, of course, what people start to encounter important, and, 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 and that, that, that's where then uh, resources will be, uh, will, will go to. And, and I think it's, 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 it's interesting, uh, I hear it from Seamus Hegarty, I don't know whether someone of you is familiar with him, he was behind the development of, of the TIMS tests at IEA at the time. Uh, he said that uh, in the first iterations of TIMS and, and uh, yeah, I believe it was TIMS, uh, Hong Kong came in mid table and that then led to an enormous impulse uh, on the side of the Hong Kong authorities in, in getting them to the top of, of the league tables and, and they got there. Uh, so could we do something similar with, uh, you know, with well-being, you know, which is, 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 as I've just indicated is, is a, a dimension of quality for us in, in under one. Uh, if you measure that and you see that a country comes in, uh, let's say, uh, mid-table and says, no, we want to be at the top of well-being, that would be fantastic. You know, then there will be some kind of like Olympic Games of uh, student well-being, you know, that, that, that will be very uh, welcome. Now, <clears throat> that's the first thing. So, so I think we could look at it from that perspective. And I think that would be 
desirable. Of course, it has to be, you know, like our construct has, has to be developed uh, more clearly. We know that well-being impacts positively on uh, learning achievements, in addition to being, of course, a value in itself. But I think the second thing that, 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 that uh, I don't know, I would just like to put up for the group on, on, for, for reflection is to what extent we conceptualize well-being as a product, you know, taking take this SIP model, uh, to what extent is this like an outcome uh, of, 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 of learning, right? Because is well-being, let's say, the outcome of, of a learning process, like, for example, maths achievement or Arabic achievement or whatever, English achievement? Or is it a factor associated with learning? What? Uh, I think that, that, that that's an important uh, question. Uh, I remember that it was the 2013 iteration of OECD PISA that asked uh, students uh, how happy they were in their schools. And, you know, my, my wife is a Peruvian and <laughs> at the time uh, I was. I, I was not nice. I was joking around with her. I said, oh, you know, Peru comes out at, uh, at the bottom of the league table. Anyway, but uh, in this question, how happy are you in your schools? You would almost take the achievement table and turn it on its head because the most happy students were in Peru, you know, and, and some of the students of the high achieving countries, Japan, Korea, came up at the bottom of that, you know, happiness uh, table. And I found that that, 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 that very, uh, you know, uh, telling. Anyway, sorry, just two thoughts I, I wanted to share. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, so um, there's lots lots to, to think through on what you just said. Um, I was doing something yesterday with um, one of the, the foundations in Manizales who supported that city's involvement in the OECD study. And Manizales topped the, um, the, the satisfaction with life component, I think, of the different indicators in the OECD study. And the, the guy from the foundation was saying you know, it was really interesting because it was definitely one of the poorer cities in terms of economic development in the um, in the whole study. Um, Ryan, we've got time for your comment and then wanted to wrap things up. So thank you. Yeah, just like mentioning also another two points to complement what have been mentioned, looking into the child participation and like working with the children uh, beyond what are other barriers around them from the government, from what is like provided from governmental schools and all of that will enable us also more to empower what we are seeking for. In addition of also the integrated approach and looking again to how much protection could be integrated into education in these schools with the evidence-based researchers would empower, again, the long-term thinking about the uh, approach of empowering the whole child development. Thank you, Brian. That's a strong note to finish on. Um, so we're almost at time. Um, I'd like very much to thank um, all of the speakers um, for the amazing presentations and, and the thoughtful input that they've all brought to the conversation. Um, as I said at the very beginning, this is the first of four uh, roundtables that we're hosting today as part of the whole child development network. Um, so different, different members of the network and partners are hosting and speaking um, at subsequent roundtables. So starting in about 30 minutes, there is a 60 minute session on stakeholder develop, uh, stakeholder engagement, excuse me. And then in two and a half hours, there is a session on uh, deciding what works and why. And then the final part of today uh, from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Central European time is on exploring effective advocacy across the education ecosystem. Um, so really interesting series of discussions still to follow. Very much hope that many of you will be able to join uh, for some of those. So thank you very much for choosing to spend part of your day with us on this. Um, thank you again to all of the presenters. And final thanks should go to the Porticus Foundation for their support for the whole, whole child development in Displaced Learning Network, because without their support, none of this would be possible. Um, so I wish you all a very safe and happy rest of Wednesday. Thank you very much indeed.